Hello, good morning everyone. I'm Dr. Yang. Today's topic will be cleft lip and palate. So at the end of the lecture, you should be able to identify the etiology of cleft lip and palate. You also should be able to classify cleft lip and palate and to formulate the treatment protocol for cleft lip and palate. As for introduction, Cleft involving lip and palate are the most commonly seen congenital deformities. Cleft of lip and palate can occur individually or together in various combinations. They can occur along with congenital defects that affect the other parts of the body. It is found to be different among different races. Negroid have the least incident, while the Mongoloids have the highest incident. Do you know where what is uh, the difference between Negroid and Mongoloids? So Negroid is uh, the people who live around the South Africa, and then the Mongoloid is the people uh, is a what we can call it maybe Asian people because they live uh, at the northern part of China. So cleft lip is common among males, while cleft palate is more common among females. The incidence for unilateral cleft, meaning one-sided cleft, is around 80% of the incident, while bilateral cleft, both right and left cleft, uh, is uh, around 20% of the incident. Now we will look into the embryological background. The face is formed by the fusion of a number of embryonic processes that form around the primitive oral cavity or what we call it stomadium. Around the fourth week of IU life, intrauterine life, five brachial arches develop at the side of the future neck. The palate is formed by the contribution of the maxillary process and frontonasal process. The union of two palatal shafts is prevented initially by the tongue, hence it grows vertically. Sometime during the seventh week of intrauterine life, the tongue descends and the palatal shaft becomes horizontal. By around eight and a half weeks, the two shafts are in close approximation. The palate is formed by the fusion of maxillary shaft with each other and with the frontonasal process. So any, any disturbance in this process will result in cleft, lip and palate. So now we will look into the etiology of cleft, lip and palate. So it can occur due to genetic and environmental factors. And I will explain by one by one. It's either hereditary, environmental and another one is multifactorial etiology. Now we will look into hereditary. Grillian reported that one in three children with cleft had some relative with similar congenital defect. Uh, of course, this is genetic. Cleft of the lip and palate can be transmitted as a dominant or recessive trait. Genetic studies have revealed that definable family history is available in 12 to 20% of cases. For the environment, teratogens are certain drugs or agents that cause disturbed growth and development in fetus. Some of the teratogens are rubella virus, cortisone, mercatopurin, methotrexate, valium indolentin. This is all the drug use. Infections such as rubella, toxoplasmosis, and syphilis has all been associated with cleft formation in the infant of infected mothers. So if the mother taking any drugs related with the teratogen, and then the baby will have higher risk of the cleft. For the predisposing factors, a number of factors are believed to increase the risk of cleft lip and palate incident. First is increased maternal age. Women who conceive late have an increased risk of having an offspring with some form of clefting. The cause is unknown. Secondly is racial. Some races are more susceptible to cleft than others. 
For example, we can see just now in the previous slide, mongoloid show the greatest percentage of incident. And the thirdly is blood supply. Any factor that reduce blood supply to the nasomaxillary area during embryological development predisposed to cleft. Diagnostic consideration in cleft lip and palate. Improvement and advance in ultrasonic technique make it possible to diagnose the presence and extent of cleft lip and palate prenatally. Ultrasonography and 3D ultrasonography enable in utero diagnosis of cleft. So in our hospital, uh, actually if uh, the parents want to know whether their baby have cleft or or not during the intrauterine life, they can request for further investigation uh, from the hospital so they can know earlier whether their baby have cleft or not before the baby were born. So the advantages of the early diagnosis before birth include uh, there is time for the parents' education on the management of the baby till it's born. And it also allows psychological preparation for the parents and allow them to have a realistic expectation. It's not easy for the parents to accept that their baby will have cleft. So this is quite difficult, especially for the first-time parents. So really, it's very important to give a psychological support to the parents. Uh, so early diagnosis also helps to detect other chromosomal abnormalities and it also gives the parents the choice of continuing their pregnancy because some parents, they don't want the baby with cleft so they might choose to, uh, they might choose to reject the baby. And then finally, uh, the advantages for early diagnosis is the opportunity for fetal surgery. Now we will move to classification of cleft lip and palate. There is a number of classification available. The one that I will explain will be some of the widely used classification of cleft lip and palate. The first one is Davis and Ritchie classification which is invented in 1922. This is a morphological classification based on the location of the cleft relative to the alveolar process. They have classified cleft into three groups. Group 1 is pre-alveolar cleft. There are cleft involve, involving only the lip and are classified as unilateral, bilateral or median. Unilateral might be left or right. Bilateral will be both right and left and median at the middle uh, near the philtrum area. Group 2 is the post-alveolar cleft. It comprises of different degree of hard and soft palate cleft that extend up to the alveolar ridge. And then group 3 is the alveolar cleft. There are complete cleft involving the palate, alveolar ridge and the lips. So meaning that the cleft will uh, is uh, continuously from the palate to the alveolar ridge up to the lip. They can be subdivided into unilateral, either right or left. Bilateral, both sides, right and left, and median at the middle uh, of the midline. The next one is views classification. This classification was invented in 1931. Uh, he has classified the cleft into four groups. Group 1, there are cleft involving the soft palate only. Group 2, there are cleft of the hard and soft palate extending up to the incisive foramen. Group 3, there is a complete unilateral cleft involving the soft palate, hard palate, lip and alveolar ridge. Group 4 is a complete bilateral cleft, both right and left, affecting the soft palate, hard palate, lip and alveolar ridge. So this is easy. Alright. The next one is classification by Wolf Anderson and this is, uh, was invented in 1942. Uh, they divided into three groups. The first group is there a cleft of the lip. It can be further subdivided into single or double. Single is unilateral or median cleft 
and double is the bilateral cleft. Group 2, there are cleft of the lip and palate. They are subclassified into <coughs> single, which is unilateral or median cleft, and double, which is bilateral cleft. Group 3, there is there are cleft of the palate extending up to the incisive foramen. So it's kind of similar to the previous classification, but there is some difference in the grouping. The next one is, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, suchet and prefer symbolic classification. Okay. So this classification, they make use of a chart made of a vertical block of three pairs of rectangles with an inverted triangle at the bottom. The inverted triangle represents the soft palate, while the rectangles represent the lip, alveolus, and the hard palate as we go down. Areas affected by clef are shaded on the chart. The advantages of this classification is its simplicity while the disadvantages is difficulty in writing, typing, and communication. So imagine when you are uh, examining the patient, you are wearing gloves. So uh, at the same time, if uh, you need to write everything on the paper, if you have a really helpful assistant, then your assistant will help you to write everything in the classification. So this is the disadvantages of this classification. So while the Advantages is it's very simple. You just shaded everything uh, what uh, you see in the patient mouth, then you shade everything according to the classification. The next one is a uh, Kernahan strip Y classification. So this is another symbolic classification uh, which was invented by Kernahan and Stark. The classification uh, uses a strip Y having a numbered blocks. Each block represents a specific area of the oral cavity. Uh, so, uh, block 1 and 4 is lip, 2 and 5 is alveolus, 3 and 6 is hard palate anterior to the incisive foramen, block 7 and 8 is the hard palate posterior to the incisive foramen, block 9 is soft palate. So, now we will, on the next slide, we will look into the uh, symbol. Okay, this is the symbol of the uh, strip Y classification, the Kernahan strip Y classification. So, uh, they have block one and four uh, is for lip, block two and five is for alveolus, block three and six. Uh, is for hard palate anterior to the incisive foramen. 7 and 8 is a hard palate posterior to the incisive foramen. And block 9 is soft palate. So for this one, you need to memorize the number. So it's quite, for me, uh, it's quite uh, difficult according to the previous classification, the Schuchert uh, and Prefer classification. So for Y classification, you just shaded uh, in areas where the cleft has occurred. But you need to know uh, what is the number represent. The next one is Lachal classification. This is a simple classification presented by O'Kryans in 1987. Lachal is a paraphrase of the anatomic areas affected by the cleft. L is for lip. A is for alveolus, H for hard palate, and S for soft palate, and then it repeats for HAL. And then this classification is based on the fact that cleft of the lip, alveolus, and hard palate can be bilateral, while cleft involving the soft palate are usually unilateral. Areas involving in the cleft are denoted by specifically indicating the alphabet standing for it. For example, L S stand for cleft of the right lip and soft palate. L A S L stands for cleft right lip alveolus and soft palate together with the left cleft lip. So you can see that uh, from the first classification in uh, 1920s up to the later to the 
uh, latest uh, classification in 1980s. So the classification is made simpler. Okay, however, uh, there is still some problem associated uh, with this classification and they try to move it, uh, they try to improve it uh, furthermore. So now, uh, we move to the next topic. What is the problem associated with cleft? So, cleft lip and palate patient is affected by a number of problems. They are broadly classified as dental problem, aesthetic problem, speech and hearing problem, and psychology problem. So, I will explain this one by one. And then firstly, the dental problem. Uh, the presence of the cleft is usually associated with division, displacement, and deficiency of oral tissue. The cleft lip and palate patient can have one or more of the following features. Firstly, they will have congenital missing teeth. Usually, they have missing teeth at the line of cleft, at the cleft area itself. For example, if patient has left-sided cleft lip and palate, and then they will have missing lateral incisor on the left side. And then they will also have presence of natal and neonatal teeth. They may have presence of supernumerary teeth, especially at the line of cleft. They also may have ectopically erupting teeth. For example, canine. Uh, usually, the cleft will extend at the uh, lateral incisor area and then patient will have missing lateral incisor. So, uh, you know that... Uh, Lateral incisor and canines are both uh, related to each other. So once patient has a missing lateral incisor, the canine usually become ectopic. Uh, usually they will erupt either palatally or labially. And then furthermore, patient can have problems such as anomalies of tooth morphology. Uh, sometimes they have packed lateral incisors, packed shaped lateral incisors. They will also have enamel hypoplasia, they have microdontia, fused teeth, uh, uh, abnormality in the crown shape, germination, dilaceration, microdontia, uh, mobile teeth, and they also have a tendency towards a class 3 skeletal pattern. And posterior and anterior, anterior cross bite may occur. They also may have protruding pre-maxilla. Usually, protruding pre-maxilla happens in a patient with a bilateral cleft, where uh, the anterior, the pre-maxilla, uh, will protrude forward and mobile. And patient may also have deep bite, spacing, and crowding. Okay, this photo shows that a patient with a unilateral cleft lip and palate. Uh, we can see that there is an absence of some anterior teeth and related more occlusion. Patient presented uh, with a hypoplastic maxilla due to the palate repair and patient also have a class three uh, mild occlusion in this photo okay and then from the opg we can see that there is some absence of some teeth and uh, there is a canine which is uh, it's not in a normal position and it become ectopic and then patient also will have aesthetic problem the cleft involving the lip can result in facial disfigurement. Orofacial structures may be malformed and congenitally missing, and they will also have some deformities of nose. Patients also will have hearing and speech problem. Uh, this is because cleft lip and palate are associated with disorders of middle ear that may affect hearing. This can cause difficulty in language uptake and speech. Uh, patient will uh, have a nasal resonance, 
palatal dysfunction and mid facial hypoplasia and all this will contribute to speech difficulties so in order to help in speech patient may need some prosthetic aids so i will explain later about uh, what we can do to help them to improve in their speech okay now we will move to the management of the cleft lip and palate Children born with the cleft lip and palate have multiple problems that have to be solved by multiple specialists. The complexity of the problem requires that a number of healthcare practitioners cooperate to ensure comprehensive care for the patient. This led to the concept of multidisciplinary cleft palate team, consists of the pediatrician, the pediatric dentist, the orthodontist, the oral and maxillofacial surgeon, prostodontist, social worker, genetic scientist, ENT surgeon, plastic surgeon, psychiatrist, and a speech uh, pathologist. And every specialist uh, and the officers in the cleft palate team should be flexible and respect each other's opinion. This cleft lip and palate team has to be described as a close, cooperative, democratic, multi-professional union devoted to the single cause of the patient well-being. The management of cleft lip and palate can be divided into four stages according to their age. So for stage one, this stage comprises of the treatment done from birth to 18 months of age. Stage two, is from 18 months to the fifth years of life. It generally corresponds to the primary dentition stage. Stage three includes the treatment carried out during the mixed dentition stage. Uh, it ranges from six to 11 years of life. And finally, stage four is include treatment done during the permanent denti denti dentition stage, which is from 12 to 18 years of age. Now, I would like to explain more on the stage 1 treatment. For stage 1, the treatment modalities carried out during the first stage include the fabrication of the passive obturator, the pre-surgical orthopedics, surgical management of cleft lip, and surgical management of cleft palate. Okay, what is passive maxillary obturator? It is an intraoral prosthetic device that fills the palate cleft and thus provide a false roofing against which the child can suckle. It does reduce the incidence of feeding difficulties such as insufficient suction, excessive air intake and choking. It also provides maxillary cross arch stability preventing the arch from collapsing. So uh, mainly the maxillary obturator is to seal the palate, palatal arch. And then when we look at the picture, this obturator is fabricated using a cold cure acrylic after we block the undercut. The undercut. And then uh, the technician will add clubs to aid knee retention. In case of insufficient retention, uh, wings can be made by thick wires and they embedded this wing in the acrylic and then uh, they will follow the cheek counter extraorally. This wing is stabilized at the cheek using a uh, adhesive tip. For the pre-surgical orthopedics, the aim is to achieve an upper arch form that conforms to lower arch. The orthodontist should try to correct the displacement by extraoral strapping across the premaxilla, which is attached directly to the face. Uh, orthodontists will use uh, adhesive tape and then it's strapped across the premaxilla. Uh, usually, uh, this strapping sometimes it will did uh, it will done by orthodontist. Sometimes the oral maxillofacial surgeon will do the strapping and sometimes the plastic surgeon will do the strapping. So that's why in cleft management, there is a multidisciplinary team where all the specialists uh, can do uh, the management together. 
the advantages uh, of this treatment is it reduces the size of the cleft thereby adding in surgery it also uh, aids in partial obturation of the cleft which can assist in feeding it also can improve speech as size of the defect is reduced so the next one is the surgical lip closure so after the uh, after the cleft team uh, stabilize uh, the premaxilla uh, it will aid in the surgical lip closure so some surgeons prefer early surgery soon after birth while others recommend a late lip surgery early school suggests that surgery should be performed within 45 days of birth so there is a variation in the timing of the surgery it depends on the surgeon Early surgery will improve the facial appearance. However, uh, there's another opinion suggests that surgery should be postponed till the completion of dentition. Millard suggests the rule of 10. Surgery should not be performed less than 10 weeks of age when the body weight is not less than 10 pounds and body hemoglobin not less than 10 grams so you need to remember the rule of 10 this rule of 10 will be asked during your bds and if you did master in oral surgery or master in orthodontics this is also a favorite question to be asked during viva and when you work in the government hospitals or when you work in a private hospital you also need to know this rule of 10 and then for the surgical palate closure the palate repair should be attempt at 12 to 24 months of age it can be accomplished using bone transplant from rib iliac and mandibular symphysis Okay, now we will move into stage 2 treatment. At this stage, patient will be around 18 months of age. And then the treatment for stage 2 carry out during the primary dentition. The procedures carried out during this phase are adjustment in intraoral obturator to maintain and check up eruption pattern and timing. Oral hygiene instruction and restoration of decayed teeth. Uh, usually, orthodontic treatment is not normally recommended for primary dentition because it will damage the underlying permanent teeth follicle. However, in a patient with a moderately underdeveloped maxilla or class 3 hereditary defect, uh, sometimes we can use reverse headgear treatment from age 4 up to 7 years old uh, and normally there is no braces treatment initiated during this stage as the benefit will be lost as soon as the deciduous teeth are shed and then after that we will move into stage 3 treatment so what will we do during this stage at this stage we will try to correct the anterior cross bite and then we will also try to correct the buccal segment cross bite using quad helix or expansion screw. The next one is stage 4. At this stage, a patient will start using fixed orthodontic appliance and the patient also may have a permanent dentition. So, all local irregularities like crowding, spacing, cross bite, or jet will be corrected. And patients with hypoplastic maxilla are given face mask or reverse headgear. And then, following fit suppliers, the patient is put on long term retention due to inadequate bone support, absence of some teeth, and presence of stretched scar tissue. Okay, this is the summary of management of cleft lip and palate from stage 1 to stage 4. 
This is what we call schedule of treatment for cleft. This schedule is very variable between different hospital, but the following is the close approximation for most centers. So at birth, what we did is initial assessment and pre-surgical orthopedics. At three months of age, uh, the hospital will do primary lip repair for the cleft babies. And then around 9 to 18 months old, the hospital will do pellet repair. And then around 2 years of age, uh, the hospital will do speech assessment for the cleft baby. And then around 3 and 5 years of age, uh, the, the cleft patient will underwent lip revisional surgery. Around 8 to 9 years of age, uh, we will have initial interventional orthodontics in preparation for alveolar bone grafting. And also, there will be a continuing speech therapy for cleft patient. And then around 10 years of age, uh, the hospital, usually the plastic surgery department, will do the alveolar bone graft. So then around 12 to 14 years old, then only the orthodontist will start orthodontic treatment for the cleft patient. Around 16 years old, the plastic surgery department will do nasal revisional surgery and then around when the growth has stopped around 17 to 20 years old, the oral maxillofacial together with the orthodontist will do a combined orthodontic treatment and orthodontic surgery and then we will have advanced conservation treatment for the cleft patient. So, for the cleft patient, the treatment start before birth for the psychological uh, support for the parents from birth till adult. So, uh, we cannot ignore the patient with cleft. So, their treatment started from uh, they were young until they're becoming adult. Now I would like to share one example of the management, how they manage the cleft lip and palate patient in Hong Kong. So what they did is they divided the management phase into four stages, which is at birth, primary dentition, mixed dentition and permanent dentition. So as I said before, this management of the cleft lip and palate is different between different hospitals. So this is another example of the other hospital in Hong Kong so that you, you can get the idea of how they manage the cleft lip and palate. With prenatal ultrasonic imaging, the cleft babies can be identified before birth as early as 15 weeks in uterine life. This enables very early counselling and psychological management to the parents. At birth, the dentist and pediatric dentist will evaluate the airway and will offer advice in feeding problems. In some cases, feeding plates will be constructed to aid in breastfeeding. At three months old, the lip repair will be done. The most common surgical technique in cleft patients were the millet repair and Tennyson lip repair. So, they also follow the three tens rule, which is the surgery should, should be done when the baby weighs is not less than 10 pounds and then the baby is, should not be less than 10 weeks of age and then the blood hemoglobin should not be less than 10 grams. Dental evaluation by the dentist can be started as early as one year old for oral hygiene maintenance and prevention of caries. Hearing assessment also can be started as early as one year old. In order to aid in speech development, palate repair is needed. So in Hong Kong, uh, the palate repair normally is done between the age of 18 to 24 years old. At 2 to 3 years old, regular dental checkup is needed as well as speech evaluation. Oral and maxillofacial surgeon may did a lip and nose revision at the age of 3. 
In certain hospital, uh, the plastic surgeon will do the lip and nose revision. So this is some variation in hospital. So uh, because this is a multidisciplinary team approach, in some hospitals, sometimes the lip and nose re revision is done by oral surgeon and sometimes it's done by the plastic surgeon. Orthodontic treatment is not normally recommended in primary dentition as it may damage the underlying dental follicle. Uh, but in cleft patients with moderately underdeveloped maxilla, uh, with no family history of class 3 skeletal, reverse headgear treatment can be advocated around 4 to 7 years old. And then this photo is uh, to show an example of reverse headgear or sometimes we call it as face mask. Uh, this photo is not uh, from a cleft patient, it's just for example. Uh, so, in Hong Kong, the reverse headgear treatment was commonly done in the past. But, however, it's not, it's not a routine now uh, because it depends on the clinician. Some clinicians prefer to use reverse headgear and some are not. Uh, plus, the long-term stability of this treatment is questionable. So, maybe it's not a popular treatment uh, these days. At around 9 to 11 years old, alveolar bone grafting will be done. The timing of surgery was determined by the root formation of the upper canine. Sometimes, the orthodontist may do expansion of the upper arch prior to alveolar bone grafting. However, there is a debate either to expand the palate or not because over-expansion of the upper arch may cause insufficient soft tissue for the palate closure during the alveolar bone graft surgery. Comprehensive orthodontic treatment can be started at least two years before the growth stop. When the growth stop at around 18 years old, combined orthodontic treatment and orthodontic surgery can be done. The general dentist and the pediatric dentist can help in the replacement of the missing teeth, especially at the cleft site. The cleft management involves a multidisciplinary approach from a team of specialists which consists of oral surgeon, orthodontist, prostodontist, pedodontist, and many more, and is started before the patient is born until adulthood. From the patient points of view, there is a burden of care that we need to consider, such as the travel expenses from their home to the hospital and the time taken for cleft treatment from birth to adulthood. In order to assess overall treatment outcome, all these matters should be put into account. Uh, so, some of the patients, they came from a poor background such and they may have a financial constraint so in order for them to come from their hometown to the hospital is quite uh, difficult for them and some of the patient they do not continue treatment so when you all uh, graduated and working uh, when you see this kind of cleft patient try to refer to the specialist as soon as possible because sometimes they miss the appointment and they just keep quiet and then they just wait for us to refer to the specialist again. So please uh, consider this as well when you start working later. As a summary, uh, you must know the management of cleft lip and palate uh, is important because they will be attended by a team of specialists who are supportive and able to provide accurate information in simple words so that they can understand. So this is the second last slide of this lecture. So it's a repetition. Uh, as a recap, you at this point, you should be able to identify the etiology of cleft lip and palate. You also should be able to classify the cleft lip and palate and you should be able to formulate the treatment protocol for cleft lip and palate. Okay. So, 
you need to read your textbook, the Balaji. So this is what I suggest you for further reading if you have more time. Okay, uh, so you can read Laura Mitchell, Introduction to Orthodontics. You also can read Handbook of Orthodontics uh, by Martin Coburn. You also can read uh, Orthodontics at a Glass by Daljit Singh. And if you have more time available, you can read William Prophet, uh, Contemporary Orthodontics. So that's all for now. I hope... Uh, I hope this lecture uh, is good for you uh, and then thank you for your attention. Have a nice day.